SM band uh, radar prototype. Essentially what this is, it's a test bed for proving uh, various uh, radar techniques. And so today I've got it configured for uh, simple um, Doppler radar function. So real quick uh, review of the hardware. I've got this broken out into uh, separate modules. The bottom module is a uh, transmit unit. It's got the uh, VCO, a power divider which uh, provides um, uh, the transmit signal over to the receiver for down conversion. And then I have a power amplifier which sends uh, the transmitted uh, uh, CW out of this antenna at uh, 17 dBm plus the 3 dB I get from this, um, this antenna. So on the receive side, I've got the same 3 dB antenna. Uh, both of these are uh, horizontally pol polarized. Then I have an LNA, a mixer which takes uh, the transmit uh, local oscillator, uh, and the receive signal mixes them together and creates a uh, baseband um, output which is indicative of the um, Doppler shift. So uh, basic uh, uh, CW Doppler radar theory is as you uh, transmit a, a CW signal out a target in motion will create a Doppler shift. And so when that uh, Doppler shifted uh, receive signal is uh, fed into the receiver and mixed with the uh, original transmit signal, you'll get uh, basically the mixed products of uh, F, uh, F1 minus F2 and F1 plus F2. So the uh, upconverted signal is, is filtered out and the downconverted signal, which is close to baseband, is a uh, replica of the actual um, Doppler shift. The uh, baseband of this unit I've got going over to this particular uh, laptop, uh, which is running Bodline. And Bodline is a basic uh, FFT software, uh, signal uh, analysis software. So if I just take my hand and wave it in front of uh, the antennas here, you can see in the uh, FFT specifically at the very low end, close to DC, which is here, the motion of my hand. And you can also see that in the time domain. So what else are we seeing on this uh, FFT plot? Well, we're seeing here 60 hertz, and here 120 hertz, 240, Uh, 360 etc. So we know that the 60 Hertz here uh, is an artifact of the power mains which uh, the AC power mains which operate at 60 Hertz here. Uh, what is 120 Hertz? You would think that is it's the uh, um, second harmonic of the 60, 60 Hertz but this particular spur is much larger. So what that is, is it's actually the uh, uh, DC power supply, which uh, mind you is very cheap and uh, has quite a bit of ripple in it. Uh, that 120 hertz is a is an artifact of uh, full wave rectification, and then you have the uh, harmonics out here of that. Okay, so I've got another uh, demo set up where I've got this fan. I'm basically just going to power this on. It's about uh, six feet away from the antenna. And you can see coming up from DC there the signature of the fan itself. And I'm going to go ahead and shut it off. And the uh, fan blades are. Uh, decreasing in speed. So again, I'll, I'll turn that fan on.
and then turn it back off again. Next what I'll do is I'll just put the, uh, the fan in oscillation mode. Let it get up to speed. You can see the uh, various aspect changes. In the previous demonstration, we can easily see the Doppler signature of the fan blades as they ramp up to 65 Hz. The Doppler response is somewhat unfortunate, as it is close to the power supply spurs and harmonics. Despite this, we can still see the Doppler signature, even if its magnitude is equal to or less than that of the interferers and even the system noise. The signal is only lost if it falls directly on 60 Hz or falls below the FFT noise floor. The noise bandwidth is defined by the number of points we use for the FFT as well as the sample rate. Such is the advantage of frequency domain analysis. However, this type of analysis may not be practical for a system design that is intended for automotive applications, where processing power is limited and response time is critical. Time domain processing is better suited for such applications. However, signal to noise and interference ratios become critical for detection and analysis algorithms. Take for example a desired return sinusoid and a higher frequency interferer of equal magnitude sharing a common node in the receiver. In this plot we can see the effects in both the time and frequency domains. A red line represents an arbitrary detection threshold 3 dB below the signal peak which could be used not only for detection but also triggering a frequency counter to determine the Doppler shift. Notice the interferer rides the desired signal causing multiple threshold crossings thus a false reading. Increasing the signal to interference ratio by 6 dB allows the interferer to no longer be detected in the frequency domain. However, it still poses a problem in the time domain. Increasing to 18 dBc, we still run the risk of false crossings. At 24 dBc, false crossings are minimized, thus for my system I will set the signal to noise and interferer ratio requirement to 25 dBc. Normally channel filtration would be used to suppress such interferers. However, because the power supply spurs lie directly in Doppler regions of interest, the system sensitivity is now dominated by the magnitude of the largest spur and is equal to the spur amplitude plus the signal to interference ratio. This greatly inhibits the system, thus the engineer must hunt down sources of interference and attenuate them. Uh, if, I, if I turn off the transmit power supply, we'll see that the, uh, the only spur that remains in this system is this 60 hertz. And if I turn off the receive power supply, it remains. So what that means is that the power supply of the laptop uh, or more to the point, the sound card itself is picking up the uh, 60 hertz from the wall. So here I'm turning the uh, receive uh, power supply back on. There was no increase at all in the noise floor, which in this type of system you want to see a slight bump in the noise floor which maintains, which means that the output uh, signal of your of your receiver uh, will be have a chance of getting actually above the noise floor of the uh, sound card. So let me go ahead and turn back on the transmit power supply. And we see our, our spurs are back. As well as the signature of the fan. So uh, as the uh, test bed, uh, as I keep adding modules onto the test bed, uh, one of the issues that will have to be addressed is the actual um, rectification spurs themselves. And the best way to do that is to put this, the system on batteries, which uh, sometimes is not practical. So uh, we'll, uh, for lab purposes, we'd have to uh, provide better, better filtration for the 
uh, power supply, you'll notice that the uh, return energy, uh, the return tones themselves are somewhat below these spurs. Well, that's uh, that's a real problem for baseband detection. Uh, typically, you'll want your return signal to be at least 20 to 25 dB uh, above any kind of interfere. Uh, so one of the ways that we can do that, again, let me shut off the, uh, the fan. One of the ways that we can do that is to amplify, uh, add some amplification uh, in our receiver. And the, uh, in my particular uh, case, I can either add a, an additional LNA in front of the receiver or add some baseband amplification. So typically uh, you want to add, um, if you add baseband amplification, you want to make sure that your uh, front end is a low noise amplifier with uh, a lot of gain so you don't add uh, noise figure to the system. Uh, or uh, more, uh, even more noise figure to the system. Uh, if you have low noise figure on the on the front amplifier with high gain, that typically dominates the cascade noise figure. Uh, another aspect too is uh, uh, the uh, when I turn on the receiver, the noise floor uh, as displayed here does not uh, move up at all. So that means that there's a gap between the noise floor of the sound card on this this laptop and the output noise floor of my particular receiver that I'm actually missing signal. So the goal of this this unit is to actually mount it uh, on the flank of a vehicle and I want to be able to detect vehicles a couple lanes over on the freeway to cover the blind spot. So you want to have enough sensitivity essentially to uh, to cover I would say maybe up to 20 feet which is doable, but you also want to be able to detect it above the, the spurs uh, from the uh, power supplies. So, how do we do that? We put the system on a battery. Uh, cars have batteries, but the problem is that cars also have alternators, which generates noise uh, both for in the, uh, in the DC lines, as well as alternators create a lot of RF energy, and specifically, uh, since we're operating this uh, uh, at this uh, low frequency baseband, it, it would pose a bit of a problem. So filtration is going to be um, key uh, to making this system work, as well as getting this, uh, uh, getting the return signals up high enough to get up above any kind of spurs that are inherent to the system.